So let me say a little bit about Plutus Core. So for the purposes of this talk, Plutus Core is the compilation target of Plutus TX. Um, so Plutus Core is system F. Um, it has ISO recursive types added to it. And also we have sized integers, sized byte strings, and we have various operations on them. And also um, Plutus Core programs will be, will be stored and executed on the, on, the, um, on the blockchain with their types normalized. OK, so you might wonder, why should we formalize this? Well, we want to move from um, pen and paper specifications to having machine check specifications and machine check proofs. So that's so that we can have higher assurance. So quite often, when you have a programming language, you might, if you're lucky, you might get the grammar in the, in the appendix in the back of the book. Um, and there are some programming languages where, where they have a formal specification, like, like standard ML. Um, and that's a, a pen and paper specification, essentially. And I, I think you can't get away with that these days. So I think you really, you really need to have um, machine check proofs. Another benefit of doing this is that we can write an extremely precise specific um, implementation to use for testing. So we can, instead of saying, for example, that you have an evaluator, which we, you know, we just say, we'll, we're only ever going to run this on world type terms because we don't really know what it does if you give it a badly typed term. And we can actually guarantee that we have an evaluator that will only ever run on the world type term, you know, by using the typing. In the same way, if you write a function which expects a list, you can't give it a string or something or an integer. Um, so, so, and this approach has been used quite quite a bit for some quite impressive to, uh, to produce some quite impressive results. So, um, there's the four color theorem, which has been formalized in Coq. That's a, a theorem that you can't check by hand because it has so many cases. And there's the very impressive CompCert C compiler, which is an industry um, standard C compiler. And um, there's also the SEL4 OS kernel, which was used very successfully in the Hackham's DARPA project. And there's KML, which is a, a form formalized um, functional language that's been formalized in Isabel. Um, you might also wonder, why do we want to use Agda? Well, um, Agda is a really nice interactive theorem prover like Coq. It's a really nice programming language. I mean, as Roman has just demonstrated, um, it's, a, it's a nice dependently typed language. Um, Haskell is, is acquiring some of these capabilities. Some of, that, some of those ideas have come, from, uh, have come from Agda. And much in the same, in the same way as Coq, proofs and programs are really the same thing because they're, they're based on the same underlying type theory. But differently to Coq, um, proving and programming are the same in Agda. It's really the same activity. So, and I think this makes it more readable and more understandable to programmers. And also, I think it's especially suitable for um, working with programming language semantics because it has a really rich um, system for working with data types where you can, you can, you can uh, be, it has a very expressive system, you can be very precise. And a very nice feature is that it interoperates very nicely with Haskell. So you can actually use real Haskell libraries. It has a foreign function interface and you can compile to Haskell. And as you've seen in the last few talks, there's a lot of expertise um, in Agda in the Plutus team. So that makes it very, very suitable for us so we can talk to each other about it. Um, so I'm, I'm actually in the formal methods team at, um, at IHK. And that team um, acts as a bridge between, between researchers and engineering. And sort of more, so that's in a, in a sort of social uh, aspect. But also, also in terms of what we actually do, you can think of it as translating basically from LaTeX um, specifications into production code and you do that in a sort of step-by-step -step way and you want to verify with each step that you've sort of you've preserved the meaning and there's some other here's an example some other um, formal methods projects at IOHK um, so the consensus pro protocol is being formalized in Isabel the ledger rules are being very carefully described um, using structured operational semantics and the wallet specification is being formalized in Coq. okay so let's just think about this uh, uh, what we have to do here. So we're you know, trying to formalize Plutus Core. So what should we actually formalize? Well, at the very least, we should formalize the syntax and the sub and substitution. We would like to formalize the type system to check it's correct. Um, we want to formalize the dynamics. So, we, so um, we're going to formalize the small step reduction relation. And this answers Sam's question. So um, we're doing operational semantics here, not denotational semantics. So, we don't, so we're not trying to interpret for all, the for all from system F in, uh, into Agda. 
Um, we can then prove progress in preservation results. We can use this to hook up an evaluator by iterating that. Um, we can compile to Haskell for, temp for testing. And this gives you a sort of, I mean, it, it, you can't uh, exactly replace the Haskell implementation because it, it's really, uh, you know, you can generate a, um, a sort of prototype Haskell program that is cer almost certain to not be as efficient and not as reliable. And the Haskell code won't be readable, but it's, um, but you can, but it's just a compilation target. So to an extent, this doesn't really matter. And of course, you could go on and do lots more things if you want to have a deeper formalization. Right, so and I'm, I'm going to look in detail at the, at the system F fragment of um, Please Score, which is in a sense the core. I will mention the extensions afterwards. But let's just um, look at system F omega. So it has three levels. So it has kinds, which are just base kind and function kind. So that's exactly like, like Fritz said, it's the, um, these are just the types of simply type lambda calculus. Um, and on the, on the type level, we have lambda application and variable. So we have the terms of simply type lambda calculus on the, on the type level. And then we have the for all, that's from the polymorphic bit from system F. Um, and we have function type. So, so you can think that, that simply type lambda calculus fits into this um, at the kind and type level. Um, and then um, at terms, we have regular lambda applica and application. We also have big lambda, so you can abstract over a type and we have instantiation which is like which is really the application but for a type variable and we have variables so you can think again system uh, sorry you can think that lambda calculus fits in at this level so there's sort of two overlapping copies of uh, of lambda calculus here and it's, it's important to bear in mind so that's my executive summary um, that we do have we have bindings in types and we have computation types but we don't have any dependency so you don't have um, terms appearing in types, so the sort of information all goes down. So um, types can refer to kinds, terms can refer to types and kinds, but it, there's, no, there's no sort of circularity which makes it not as hard as dependent types. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the syntax of this in detail. And I, So this, uh, this is both the syntax and, and the type system, so this is another kind of version of um, propositions as types. So um, if you think about it in terms of syntax, what this means is it's impossible to construct a term which is ill-typed. So this makes it very, very precise. Um, you can also just think of this as a straightforward formalization of the type system. And of course, we are interested in properties of the type system. So let's look at it in detail. So we have kinds at the top. Oh, I can use my pointer. So we have kinds. We have, um, this is the kind of types. And then we have function kind. That's the f omega part, right? And then here we have types, and this is written in a way to, to remind us of the type system. So we have variables, um, and we have lambda. And here you can see that uh, the result is in, in uh, context phi, but the body has an additional variable. So, um, so that gives us guarantees that things are in scope. And here, with application, you, you can see the, the guarantee of well-typedness, because you have something, or well Kind, kindedness, I guess. Um, so here you have something of function kind, something of the appropriate arguments, and then you get something of the appropriate result. And you cannot fit together things that, that are not supposed to be fitted together. And here we have the binder, rule or pi, and that the body of that is abstracted over an additional variable. And you notice that this, that, that pi constructs something of, of kind star, um, and so does uh, the arrow type. So these are, in a way, these are like the sort of base, the two base types. Oops. And then in the syntax, so this is, this is um, indexed over a context and a type. And uh, here we have variables, we have application, um, sorry, variables, lambda, application, we have big lambda, inst an instantiation, and and then we have this rather annoying thing called the conversion rule. And this is a typing rule. Um, and we need this because we've got computation at types. Because you might have a type which is which are really the same. It's just, you know, somebody hasn't reduced a bit of it yet. You, might have a, you can have a beta reduction in a type. And we want to make sure those things are the same. Otherwise, the system is not going to work. So, so that actually appears as a, as a syntactic constructor if, in the, if you work in this way. But this is, 
I would say this is the standard presentation of system f omega with the conversion rule. Right, so then we need some functionality. We've written the type system down. Um, we need to implement substitution for types because they're, you know, we need it. And we also have to prove stuff about, um, about our substitution. We want to know it's correct. And my, my favorite way of doing this is, to, which is because you only have to prove there are just three properties, is just that you, you prove this forms a relative monad. So substitution is bind and the, the variable constructor is return. So I think that's a nice way of presenting it. And, and then the funny thing is we actually need to use both of those things, the operations on types and the proofs when we define sub substitution on terms. And that means that, the, that our proofs have to compute. We can't postulate something or use the principle which is okay but doesn't have any computational behavior. So we really need that the proofs compute. So that's an essential property. And uh, Connor McBride taught me a, a nice trick which allowed me to do this because we represent substitutions as functions and, um, and we're still able to avoid using extensionality. Okay, so that's that, that's fine. However, we run into a halt here um, because we can't prove progress and preservation for this system. Um, and that sort of stops us in our tracks. And that's because we don't really know what to do with this conversion rule because we need to kind of somehow push it through the terms and it's not clear at all how to do that. But there is a solution. We can normalize the types. So here is a presentation of the type system again with normalized types. Um, so this has got rid of all the beta reductions. So, and because we're using De Bruyne indices um, for variables, that means that um, normal forms are really unique. So if you normalize two things that are beta eta equal, um, if you normalize them, then you will, if they're, the, if they're beta eta equal in the first place, you literally get identical normal forms. So this gives us sort of unique represent, representatives of types. Um, and so the way we do that is we, we define normal forms in neutral terms. Uh, a, neut a neutral, so a normal form is something that's sort of in constructor form, so it's either a lambda or a pi or an arrow. And a neutral term is a stuck term. In particular, it's something where the, the thing in the function position in an application is a variable or, or some other stacked um, sequence of things applied to a variable. So we have neutral terms which are either variables or they're an application where the thing in the function position is neutral. And then we have the normal forms which are in constructor form basically or neutral terms. So that's the, so we replace types with normal types and that means that we, you know, we're indexing by normal types um, in, the, in the type of uh, terms. And it, it's great because we can get rid of the conversion rule altogether. It disappears because it means that these, this A and B, they're not just B to equal, they're actually identical. So we don't need the rule at all. So it's going to write terms using the general system and then normalize the types away. Yes, yes. And in fact, that's an important point I'll come to in a minute. Yeah. Okay, so uh, then, so what do we want to do? Well, we want to implement, implement substitution, right? But now, so that's fine, we can, we can do that, except we need to make sure that our, sub, our substitution operation is normalizing. And there are various ways you can do that. You can use hereditary substitutions. I've used MBE and um, a combination of MBE and substitutions. Um, and so that works, that's fine, except, so now the, the sort of, uh, you, you actually need to, you need to have proofs about normalization potentially in, in your, in your proofs about substitution, but that all works. And then we can do progress. And progress says, so we've got a term, a well-typed term, then either we will get, a, either it's already a value, so we can't compute it any further, or it can make a step to another term. And we don't actually need to even um, talk about preservation, which is saying that the, the, when we do reduction, the type is, is the same as the one we started with, because this is guaranteed, because uh, we're doing, we're in a dependently typed language. So when we write, a, when we specify reduction, we just say that, you know, it goes from one term in, in a particular type to another term in the same type. So that's just built in. Um, and a nice thing that I learned from Phil is that we can iterate this and write an evaluator. So we just say, if you, if you have a, a well-typed term and, you, and you're, allow, you're allowing um, evaluation of a, of a certain number of, of steps, of reduction steps, then we're either going to get, oh, sorry, we are going to get an, a new term that uh, it reduces to in, in zero or more steps. And we might get a value out as well. Um, and we, we won't get a value if, uh, 
if we run out of gas, basically, if we, were, if we didn't allow enough steps. Is this a squared recursion? Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, can be. Yeah. It, yes, yeah. I mean, you could still do this if you didn't want to bother with termination, but yeah, yeah. So you said yes, no, can be? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me try to be clear. So um, what I meant was, you know, we can do this. I have done it for, um, for the full system, but here I'm talking about the smaller system, so I'm maybe being overly pedantic. But, you know, it, it, it works, it is done for the full system, yeah. Okay. Yes. Just can you clarify a little bit the, the normalizing part because you have not just pure system f kind, but you have sorry, not the mega kind, but you also have the ifix in there. And yeah, yeah. So so that doesn't um, at the type level, it basically it doesn't. So the the type the type language is normalizing. Um, the term language, yes, because it's just you just have this constructor mu. And it doesn't do anything. It just it's just a binder. But, 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 do you, but, but do you then really capture the full conversion theory? It sounds like in my I, case, I believe so, yeah. Yeah. So we're doing so we have um, so there's an isomorphism, right? I mean so but, yeah. but so we have wrap and unwrap are are uh, constructors at the term level. So the type the, the there's nothing there's no weird computation happening at the type level. Okay, so this yeah. is, so basically the this is the key thing is that you're not treating types as you do with other types. We're so using iso recursion yeah, rather than yeah, so iso recursion. So they're all very different types. Because yes, yeah. So we, yeah, so we have witnesses of the isomorphism. Yeah, we're not doing equi recursive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we have time, I'll have a slide somewhere at the end. But OK. Anyway, so um, yeah, we can come back to that. So OK, so I've solved the problem, right? So I had a type system I couldn't work with. Now I've got another type system. Um, that I can work with. So what should I do? Should I just chuck away the first one and forget about it and say it was wrong and just work with the... Kenneth is nodding uh, enthusiastically. But <laughs> and, then, uh, yep. and then just work with the new one? Well, I, I think the, the original one is kind of like the standard textbook definition of what system F omega is supposed to be. So we should, instead, we should pr prove how they're related. And the way we should do that is we should... You can think of the second type system as like being the type checker. And we are trying to prove that our type checker, we should prove it's sound and complete. So soundness says, if our type checker, which is this normal version, says yes, then the original system should say yes as well. And here we have this weird situation where, so we've got, we, to, to, if we, here we've, you know, gamma and, out and A are normal things. So gamma is a, is a context of normal stuff. And... We then have to actually, if we, we have to write a function that embeds those normal things back into the syntax to, to be able to talk about this, this uh, syntactic judgment. So we have to embed both of those. But that's just saying, if our type checker says yes, then the, then the real system should say yes. Otherwise, our type checker is doing something weird. And completeness says that if, our type, if, if it's something is really well typed, then our type checker should say, should say yes as well. Right? Otherwise, it's missing some stuff. Um, and the way this is specified, you're allowed a bit of wiggle room, so you don't have to, if, you're, if, if the original type system says something has a, has a particular type, you don't have to say that my new type checker um, says it has the same type. You just have to say it has a type and that they are beta, eta, equal, so and they would normalize to the same thing. So you have that extra bit of wiggle room. Um, and this is, so interestingly, if we're thinking about type systems, these are, these are kind of... Um, theorems we would need to prove, but if we think about programs, then they're sort of interesting programs, and, and one of them does exactly what Sam just, just mentioned, which is the second one takes a term and normalizes its type. So that's just a kind of a useful thing you might want to do, particularly if you want to store something with a normalized type on the blockchain. And the other one takes a normalized thing and then just converts it back to an ordinary thing. And, and this, this extra property that A is, is beta eta equal to its normal form um, is a property or is the soundness property from, uh, from an, a standard normalization proof. Okay, and then there's a kind of a, I really like this one line of this, uh, of this function. Um, so the way it normalizes a type, so 
here we've got a conversion. So we've got sort of A is of type A. This says that A is equal to B and the whole thing is of type B. So then we need to produce something of the type normalized B and we've got something of type normalized A. So that's the problem. We, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem to work. But we've proved that if A is B to, equal to, B to E to equal to B, then their normal forms are identical. And, we can, and we've got exactly, this P is exactly of this form. So we can apply this thing and rewrite the goal. And then magically A is exactly of the right type to put into the goal. So we've just collapsed. So this, this, uh, this proof or this program just goes through by collapsing all the conversions until there are none left. So I think that's really nice. And if we just take a step back for a minute and think, um, what did we just do? Well, I would argue that this is, is IOHK's formal methods approach in miniature. It's like one step of it. Um, because we started with this standard definition from a textbook and we've converted it to a, to a version that actually works. And we, you know, it's algorithmic. It, you know, we can implement a type checker um, using it. And we've proved that this step was valid with our soundness and completeness proofs. So I'm short of time, but uh, so, so that was, we just had a kind of a deep dive into the core of Plutus core, which is system F omega. So now let's just think about what we need to add. Well, we need to add recursive types and we need to add built-in types and we, which are sized integers, sized byte strings. And um, we need to add um, some other operations uh, that work with these uh, byte strings, et cetera. So let me say a little bit about system. This is maybe not going to satisfy Fritz because I'm not going to go into enough detail, but um, uh, we need these isorecursive types, as you've heard a lot about, because we want to translate data types. It, they also give us general recursion because you can type the Y combinator or variations on it, like the Z combinator, using these types. Um, and you can, Scott, exam, Scott Newman was an example of that. And does that mean that type evaluation might not terminate? It doesn't, because it's still normalizing. Um, and then, so how do we work with built-ins? Well, so built, so for integers, they're sized. And you can just think of that as like a pair of, um, ah, I, um, I edited my slide just before my talk and I've introduced a mistake. Uh, <laughs> so um, you have an integer and it has a size, and I represent that as being basically a pair of that integer, not a natural number, and, um, and a proof that it's within the bounds. And the bounds are specified in, in bytes, and this is a calculation to, to give that it's within the maximum minimum value. Um, and then with byte strings, we just, the size is the length. So when you have a byte string, we, all, byte string, we also have a proof that it's, it's shorter than, than the particular length. And when we implement operations on those things, we check the bounds. So when you add two numbers together, they have to be of the, so the type of addition says that the two things you take have to be of the same size and the result has to be of the same size. And we check if the result is, is within the bounds. Um, and if it's not, then this operation fails. And then you have, and if you want, if you want to produce something bigger, you have to explicitly resize it using a resizing operation. Um, and then, yeah, and when we, when we compile these, we actually can compile them to, uh, we can compile these built-in things to the, the same Agda library operations that the proper implementation uses. When you say fail, is the whole execution stop, or is there a exception, exception? It just says, it says error. I mean, so the whole thing computes to an error. Like, it, so errors sort of bubble up to the top. Yeah. Um, so I want to say a little bit, I'm already over time, but I want to say a little bit about compilation to Agda, sorry, compilation to Haskell. So you, you can take any Agda program and you can try to compile it to Haskell. And it can use Haskell libraries when compiled. Um, and so I want to kind of like with integers, I want them to be compiled to Haskell in integers. But there's a question about how do you represent this in Agda? And there are sort of two ways, and I've, I've actually I've used both of them. Um, so you can model them in, uh, in Agda, and that means that you can then use them sort of in Agda. You can, you can write proofs, you can run um, programs in Agda, like adding integers, et cetera. Um, so you can model them. Um, but the, you don't really have a guarantee that when, when the thing you modeled, when you compile it, 
when you compile your version of addition to the, Has to the Haskell version, that the Haskell version is the same. So, and it, there's also a sort of a conceptual thing about where do, what are we actually trying to formalize? You know, are we, are we trying to formalize as much as possible or are we trying to formalize Plutus core and how it interacts with the real world? So this is kind of an approach where you try to model everything. Um, so I'm experimenting with that. Um, and then, for, whereas for byte strings, I've represented them opaquely, which is we just say there's, there's a set, or it, which is a, basically a type in, in Agda called byte string. It has a length operation, and of course, you know, it has some other operations on it as well. Um, and when we compile byte string, it gets compiled to, to the Haskell byte string from the byte string library. And when we compile the length function, it gets compiled to the length function. Um, and we can still, even though we're doing it opaquely, we can, it still means that we can sort of th think about and even what prop we can think about what properties of these things we need to have and we can write them down and that's that's already helpful and we can also we could we can uh, you know just gives us some clarity about what we're expecting from the inter this interface to the real world um, I would like to connect proving and testing in the following way so I would like um, the the Plutus score built-in operations I would like to check that they have the right properties. For example, um, for any byte string and any integer, if you take something off the front of, the, of that byte string and then you, uh, then you drop um, the same amount of things off the front and then you stick those things together, you should get back the original byte string. Right? So that, that um, property should hold for Plutus byte strings. We also expect that it would hold for... Um, uh, for the Haskell Im implementation, and, I, and that's something you could actually just quick check in with the Haskell Im implementation. So I think this is a nice way of connecting, proving, and, uh, and testing. Um, okay, right, I've got to the end of my talk. So I'd say the contributions are that we've got a machine checked uh, version of the meta theory for in intrinsically typed and intrinsically sized Plutus core. We can, we can compile to Haskell, execute uh, small examples, um, and this is a nice thing because this means we can sort of compare the real implementation. We, we can test the real implementation against uh, this version. And I'm extremely happy with my MBE proof because it had to be really good because it gets used. At, it actually, I had to run it. Uh, so I'm very happy with that. And I'd maybe like to try to publish that on its own. Um, ah, and I should also, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, two people, so James McKinnon was extremely helpful talking to me about pure type systems where some of these issues with conversion come up. And um, System F Omega is, a, is one of the systems um, which fit into this much more general version of pure type systems. And, um, and also Guillaume Allais helped me out when I, when I ran headfirst into, a, into an Agda compiler bug, and, um, which is not hard to do. So, OK. <laughs> Thank you. OK. And some uh, quick final thoughts uh, as closure of the academic track that, uh, first of all, uh, thank you everyone uh, for uh, joining the track today and for all the discussions. Um, maybe just a, a few thoughts uh, from my point of view. I was a PhD student uh, back in the end of 90s when I became familiar with uh, Lawrence Lessig's uh, code uh, and other laws of cyberspace and the now famous code is law tenet that uh, he popularized at the time. And uh, what a better uh, example 20 years fast forward to deal with smart contracts and what a great manifestation uh, of this powerful idea. So uh, looking back, uh, it was programming languages and programming practices at the time and even today up to the challenge uh, for this, and the answer is clearly no, as we've seen on and on, with all the failures we've seen uh, in systems that are being developed. But this is changing, and, uh, uh, and today this event is also a testament on that. So it's uh, very, very inspiring to be here, and thank you all for uh, joining the academic track of Plutus Fest. There is now lunch, uh, and Plutus Fest continues on the main track. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.